Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Henry Hale. I'm professor of political science and international affairs here at George Washington University's Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. And uh, on behalf of our institute uh, and its liberal studies, liberalism studies program, we are very pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Stephen Hall to talk about his new book. Um, the book is called The Authoritarian International, and I was just commenting to him that I really love the cover. Um, so we look forward to the subject matter, as I think uh, the, the cover itself illustrates how interesting it is. Um, I'll note that um, the, Dr. Hall is a lecturer in Russian and post-Soviet politics at the University of Bath in the UK, and uh, he earned his uh, PhD at uh, University College of London in the uh, famous School of Slavonic and East European Studies, and um, he's had uh, postdoctoral fellowships at, uh, at at the University of Cambridge, and um, so we're very pleased that he can come and share his uh, uh, main ideas from his book, and we look forward to a, uh, a lively discussion afterwards. So we've asked him to speak for roughly half an hour, and uh, then we'll open it up to uh, you for questions, and um, you can please uh, pose your questions uh, in the uh, chat function of uh, of Zoom and make sure they're directed to me uh, and I'll moderate that uh, that discussion. So uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Henry. And I'd like to thank you and Marlene as well for allowing me to do this. It's a wonderful opportunity. I'd like to begin in the traditional British way with an apology. Um, in terms of how, when this book was uh, sent to the public publisher, Cambridge University Press, the war had just begun. So the title, which includes the post-Soviet space, I don't want to cause anyone any upset when I refer to post-Soviet states. We still haven't developed a new label to really explain this region, whether we go with Central Asia, the South Caucasus, uh, East Central Europe in terms of Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, what have you but I don't mean to cause anyone any offence. I'm just using the post-Soviet space as a way to be more concise in terms of what I'm saying. So without further ado, I'm going to give a brief outline explaining why I chose the case studies that I look at, the four case studies that I look at. I'm going to do have a bit of theory. I don't want to bore all of you too much, so it's only going to be a couple of slides in regards to that. Then looking at findings and then conclusions, but also some policy implications potentially. And we can discuss these and also the war on Ukraine in the Q&A. So without further ado, the case selection. In regards to the post-Soviet space, one really has to look at Russia pretty much when one is always comparing the region. And in terms of authoritarianism, or autocracy, Russia is particularly prevalent. And I think that to really understand authoritarian learning in the post-Soviet space, one needs to look at Russia. So Russia is a key study here. Another, what I wanted to do was to compare it with another autocracy originally. And I thought about Kazakhstan, I thought about Uzbekistan, but Belarus always seemed to be the country that had the most relevance towards its linkage with Russia. So Belarus became a case study fairly quickly. And then I really wanted to look in more detail at this idea of authoritarian learning, and not necessarily between autocratic regimes, but, but between leaders who have authoritarian tendencies. And this led me to an, on another direction. Looking at Ukraine, I'm not saying Ukraine is an autocracy. I would say that it has never been an autocracy, whatever Vladimir Putin may say. But it certainly has had periods of attempted autocratic consolidation under Leonid Kushma, but also under Viktor Yanukovych. And another example, I wanted to also have a fourth example, another case study where there isn't an established autocratic regime in the post-Soviet region, that's quite hard to do. Georgia and Armenia are possible examples. But in order to be geographically coherent, I chose Moldova. And again, this is represented by the cartel of Vladimir Plahotniuk, the grey cardinal behind the throne, at least until 2019 in Moldova, and Igor Dodon, the, nominally, the prime minister, nominally socialist, 
but someone who also had ties to Vlahotniuk. Vladimir Voronin is another example in terms of an authoritarian-minded leader in Moldova. The cases run from 2000, when Vladimir Putin became president, until 2021. Um, that's when the book ended, really. I, say, I started with 2000 because this is when Putin came to power. It's when Lukashenko had largely consolidated power. It's when Kushma won his second presidential term and went on a trajectory towards weak autocracy. And the same is also true of Vladimir Voronin in Moldova. So moving on to the theory, a brief definition from my work with Thomas Ambrosio way back in 2017. We defined authoritarian learning at the time as a process in which authoritarian regimes adopt survival strategies based upon prior successes and failures of other governments. Now, the book has largely, largely concentrates on those survival strategies, trying to understand how autocracies develop best practices to maintain power. But I think authoritarian learning is broader than this, and that's certainly something for future research to do. More importantly, possibly, I think that the definition that I did with Tom back in 2017 doesn't ex quite explain authoritarian learning as much as it should, in that it focuses on learning between states. What I actually found in the book is that there is a lot of learning intrastate as well, primarily in places like Ukraine and Moldova, where elites have been in previous regimes and then they've become presidents or they've become interior ministers. Think Petro Poroshenko, who has been the bellwether of Ukrainian politics up until 2019 when he lost to Volodymyr Zelensky, but he had been in power in various iterations in various regimes. And so we've taken ideas from Kushma, from uh, Yanukovych, even from Yushchenko as well. Authoritarian learning involves diffusion, the spread of ideas. Ultimately, this is what diffusion is. There's also linkage. Now, Stephen Levitsky and Luke and Wei talk about linkage and leverage in terms of the leverage that the links that democracies have with autocracies and the leverage that democracies have over autocracies to begin the democratic transition of those autocracies. What I found is that autocracies don't necessarily like others having leverage over them because this can lead to a loss of power, regime change possibly, um, but they do have a lot of linkage. And this is certainly explains how learning operates. There's also adaptation, the process of adjusting to different conditions. And autocracies are constantly trying to learn, to develop best practices, to stay in power. Very few, in fact, I would say no, autoc no autocrat wants to end up like Muammar Gaddafi, dragged through the streets of Misrata and beaten to death with lead piping. They would like to end up like Francisco Franco, dying at a ripe old age in their bed, um, and that's all good for them. So it is the need to constantly try and adapt because an autocracy has to be right every single time. Every threat, the autocrat has to be right, has to do it correctly. Whereas protesters, for instance, only have to get it right once for the autocracy to fall. There's also emulation. I don't know if this is a um, phrase used in America, but it's a phrase used in the United Kingdom of keeping up with the Joneses wanting to do better than your neighbours. And this certainly is the case for autocrats, that they try to outdo one another in terms of developing the best practices that others will copy, although no, very few people, very few autocrats ever admit that they've copied from other people. There's also policy learning. When policymakers in these regimes will compare external and plausibly internal policy legislation as well to see what works, let's say, in Azerbaijan and how it can be used in Tajikistan or Turkmenistan. And there's also policy transfer. This is more the internal aspects, I would say. The nuances between policy learning and policy transfer are quite detailed. I don't want to go into too much detail too much detail because I don't have the time, but policy transfer is generally between ministries. So say the defense ministry will look at what the interior ministry has been doing 
and implement those policies. So this is the first part of the theory. In terms of the wider literature, there has been two prevalent literatures, I would say. The concept of the authoritarian gravity sensor, which has a very vertical analysis in terms of authoritarian learning. Think in regards to a university, a teacher-pupil scenario, where the teacher is at the front of the classroom talking to the pupils and they're making notes or, or not um, on how to deal with media or the opposition. The idea of the authoritarian gravity center is that countries like Russia, but also China and Singapore, less so Venezuela and Iran today, are the center of the solar system. They are the sun. And other countries like Belarus, Kazakhstan, Armenia, plausibly even Hungary and Poland on the outer part of the solar system are planets that spin round the sun. And the idea is that Russia dispenses lessons to these countries. The other concept is authoritarian promotion, that places like Russia and China serve as models for other autocrats, similar to the authoritarian gravity centers in that respect, but that they also promote autocracy to these, to other autocrats. Now, what I found, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail in the findings, is that authoritarian learning, in my mind, is far more horizontal than vertical. It doesn't fit the authoritarian gravity centers model, primarily because, as I argue in the book, autocrats want to survive and therefore they are willing to take lessons from each other. That the regional hegemon will willingly learn from other autocracies. And Russia has learned an awful lot from places like Belarus, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan as well. In terms of authoritarian promotion, for me, this doesn't necessarily work primarily because the argument is that Russia promotes autocracy to places like Belarus and Kazakhstan, but these countries were already, already consolidated autocracies by the time Putin came to power. What I argue in the book, following Thomas Ambrosio, is that this is autocratic bolstering, that Russia supports these countries against democratization pressures. So, in terms of the findings, reiterating again, and I think this is key, that learning is horizontal, that autocrats are constantly trying to develop best practices, constantly adapting to threats, and they are willing to learn from each other. They are willing to learn from democracies if necessary as well, and we can talk about that in more detail. That the networks of learning are extensive. Previous research has focused primarily on the role of the presidents, and this is perfectly understandable. It's relatively easy to trace where presidents come and go, but, what we can see is that learning is extensive across different ministries. They regularly meet one another. It's going down, at least in the book, as far down as first deputy prime, first deputy minister of the interior, security services, security council, where have you, it's happening. And I think further research can go even deeper in terms of where these regimes actually learn from. Internal learning is crucial, particularly in regards to places like Moldova and Ukraine. Again, as I mentioned, because elites have been um, in previous regimes, they've taken ideas from those regimes and implemented them in the present uh, government. Also, learning from success is important. This is much harder to find. We can easily see autocratic learning failure, primarily because when, a, when an autocracy fails, it fails spectacularly. Again, the Gaddafi example is key here, as is the Saddam Hussein example of being found in a well, and obviously the uh, war on Iraq. But success is much harder to locate because autocrats don't like talking about uh, the success of others and copying from them. But we can certainly see that there are examples of learning from success. We know that Nikolai Petrushev, the head of the Russian Security Council, regularly went to Algeria after the Arab Spring to find out how the Algerian regime had dealt with their protests. And autocracies learn from democracies. And we can see this in terms of Sergei Kirienko, the head of the domestic aspect uh, area of the presidential administration in Russia, openly saying, that they have taken, a, they've tried to implement how Trump used social media in 2016 to win the American presidential election. This was the idea that the elite 
in the Kremlin needed to get access to Twitter or X as it is today and start tweeting to try and engage with younger Russians. So certainly this is important and we can talk about this as well. In terms of the secondary, the second findings, I use this as a reference from one of my interviewees who at the begin beginning of the uh, interview stated that 95% of what autocrats need can be found on Google or Yandex to use its Russian equivalent. That all they need to do is type in protests in Zhanazen in Kazakhstan and they will find enough data from videos, from websites to work out how the Kazakhs overcame the protests there. Also in Belarus in 2020 or 2017, where have you, and therefore they don't need to talk to each other. What I found is, and I'll go back to this, that this isn't the case, that these networks are extensive. It isn't just the spread of ideas as diffusion would have it. It is a far stronger version of diffusion with regular contact. Every month, there are interdepartmental commissions of, from various countries meeting with one another. There are extensive networks. We can't touch the surface, surf, surface in terms of emails and phone calls, but we can certainly say see how these individual individuals in the regimes meet, and they do meet regularly to discuss how this is happening. And also, regional organisations play a particularly key role, I would say, in terms of how autocracies learn. Regional organisations in the post-Soviet space are learning rooms. I'm going to exclude the Eurasian Economic Union from this analysis. I wouldn't say that the Eurasian Economic Union provides learning. It is a bolstering organization, supporting the economies of these countries to help them against recessions, against which could spark, spark protests. Also, I appreciate the Shanghai Cooperation Organization isn't a post-Soviet regional organization, at least in its entirety. It includes China, India, Pakistan, and most recently, Iran. But it does include post-Soviet countries. And we know that there are, at least at the Commonwealth Independent States, um, biannual, every six months, meetings are held between the presidents, the prime ministers, the foreign ministers, the defense ministers, the interior ministers, the head of the security councils, you name it, they meet. And we also know that there are informal meetings where no information is provided. And in regards to the collective, this organization and the collective security treaty organization, we know because these delegates have, si have signed their names that they have been in the room. And we know as well, gleaning information from documents in these organizations, that they are discussing color revolutions, the Euromaidan, how to deal with neo-Nazis, how to deal with color protests, these sort of things. We also know from the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the Unbreakable Brotherhood anti-terrorist uh, exercises. And the same is also true of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Regional Anti-Terrorist Center as well that some of the training exercises could be uh, have a broad definition of what terrorism is. In terms of the 2011 Donbass uh, training exercises, it was an anti-terrorist exercise against the type of terrorist who takes to the streets waving flags and shouting slogans. To you and me, this is protesters. And so we can actually see that these, or these organizations provide training exercises to, for the security services, for the interior ministry troops to deal with protesters and to learn best practices from each other. So I think this is particularly important in terms of how, it may just be a post-Soviet phenomenon, but in terms of how regional organizations are particularly important to awful authoritarian learning. So in conclusions, autocracies are constantly learning. They have to in order to survive. They are trying to develop best practices to maintain their power. They are constantly dealing with threats to that power. But it's not always successful. What may work in Baku may not necessarily work in Moscow or Minsk. And so the Russian regime may have seen what worked effectively in Azerbaijan, tried to implement it, and for whatever reason, it's failed because it doesn't transfer from Baku to Moscow. So certainly these regimes are constantly trying to adapt, but are not always successful at doing so because 
ultimately they are continually faced with threats. Regional organizations are key, I think, to authoritarian learning, at least in the post-Soviet context. And success and internal learning are just as important, I would say, as learning from failure and external learning. So learning between states, learning from the failure of others. But success, much harder to measure, and internal learning also harder to measure. I think the book does highlight these and certainly shows that these are as relevant to understanding how autocracies survive. So in terms of policy recommendations, we know that autocracies are growing in number and this puts greater competition over international norms. That the number of autocracies is growing, that authoritarian regimes are acting as models to other autocracies and weak democracies or authoritarian minded leaders like China, Singapore, Russia, until possibly the war in Ukraine were models that could be used. And they are, particularly China, trying to take control over international organizations to, to establish and change the norms and values by which we live. Joe Biden, in my mind, was right to advocate that democracies need to unite, that this is a competition. Democracy is no longer the only game in town, and democracies need to find ways to re-engage, to promote their values. And I'm not talking about democratization like George Bush and Tony Blair with the war in, on Iraq and the war in Afghanistan, but certainly there can be greater pressure, support, I would say, for media in these countries, for civil society, for the opposition, in terms of how the West can give support to these groups. And we can talk about possibly the implications for this and Russia, but democracies need to maintain the pressure on autocracies because autocracies have to be, as I said before, have to be right every time. And if they are facing greater pressure, it's more likely they will make mistakes. We can, of course, wait. There is always the ivory tower situation that as an autocracy, as an autocrat ages, they become increasingly dis disassociated from society. We can see this in terms of Belarus in 2017, when the Belarusian regime decided to, the greatest, best way to deal with an economic recession was to tax the unemployed, and that led to mass protests. We can see this in terms of the 2020 in the Belarusian protests as well. Lukashenko believed he understood Belarusian society and was shocked when Belarusian society ch had changed. The same is also true possibly of Putin. The idea of cognitive bias in regards to Ukraine and believing their own propaganda over Ukraine, I think has been a key reason for why Russia invaded the full-scale invasion. So we can wait, but this takes time. Luke Putin has been in power for 23 years. Lukashenko for 29, if my, if my maths is correct. So this is certainly possible, but I think in terms of the policy, democracies need to develop new ways to pressure autocrats into making those mistakes. So I'd like to end here. Thank you very much for your time. And please, any questions? Okay, uh, excuse me, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's a, a fascinating research and um, you know very important um, work in terms of uh, focusing our attention on key questions of um, the development of authoritarianism, its durability, and uh, just basically understanding where it is coming from and where it's likely to go. Um, we're starting to accumulate questions, so I just ask people to you can pose them either in the chat or using the Q and A function. Uh, but maybe I'll take the liberty as chair to ask a, a first question. Um, which is just kind of the big picture of um, how important uh, do you see this learning being? Um, and, and so maybe uh, just to put, to communicate what I have in mind, um, you know, maybe let me pose the counterfactual. Would we still expect Russia to have been, have become what it is today um, without learning? from the regimes uh, around it or other regimes in the world? Would we st still be likely to see Russia something like it is today or has the um, learning process actually transformed it potentially mm -hmm. from something different? So I know it's unfair, counterfactual question, we can't rerun history, uh, but I would be interested just in your thoughts uh, on that question. Mm 
No, I think that's certainly fascinating. I mean, the institutions, possibly, if you want to go down the Hunt Huntingtonian analysis in terms of the culture as well, that Russia was always going to be autocratic, at least uh, I'm sure Samuel Huntington, if he was still with us, would, would, have, would say this. But I think it's necessarily, you know, that may be the case. But learning, I think, is important in terms of developing those best practices, maintaining the ability to adapt, because an autocracy, if it doesn't learn, is more like I would say is more likely to make mistakes because it won't take examples from other places. But it by collaborating together, by cooperating, by seeing what's happening in, say, uh, Dushanbe, seeing how uh, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan dealt with certain things, that this can also be a way to ensure the survival of the Kremlin in in Moscow. So I think that, yes, of course, it's possible that Russia would have been an autocracy, and I think that's largely the case. But certainly learning allows it to adapt, allows it to develop and to maintain its survivability, for want of a better phrase. Oh, Henry, I think you're muted. Sorry, yes, great. Um, yeah, maybe I'll ask just one other question. Okay. Um, I, I, we're already getting questions coming in, but um, I guess I'd be interested just again, focusing on Russia, what you think the relative importance is of different forms of learning. Uh, in, in particular, um, I think you made the very important point that autocratic practices, many of which we see in Russia today, were actually already existing in places like Belarus much earlier. You could also point to Kazakhstan. Um, but then also you know, some of the same practices that we see in Russia on the national level, um, or at least that we we saw develop under Putin at the national level in, in Russia, had also existed in Russia in certain enclaves. Uh, you know, Tatarstan, for example, is a very authoritarian region within uh, within Russia, just to name one. Um, you know, so I guess just, uh, you know, to what extent do you see the development of authoritarian institutions and practices in, in Russia learning more from the neighbors around it, uh, as opposed to the different federal units within it that were all experimenting especially during the 1990s and uh in at least the early part of the Putin years um you know or or do you see this all as part of a process that just kind of went together roughly in balance i think that's certainly fascinating i mean vladimir gelman and tamila lankana have written about subnational authoritarianism um and i think that's you know it's certainly fascinating in terms of how whether moscow looks at what's happening in kazan or in ufa and went, ah, we can do that. Um, that certainly would be fascinating. I don't know whether that's the case. I would say that um, it isn't necessary. I would say that Moscow wouldn't look at that. They'd be more likely to look at what's happening in Minsk because it is a consolidated autocracy at a national level rather than a regional level. And yeah, so I would say that they're more attuned to look at that. We know as well that if we believe Mikhail Zigas or the Kremlin's men, that Putin see, saw Karimov as um, a hero for the person who overcame the color revolutions, although he did it very bloodily with the shooting of 500 protesters in Andijon. I've written about how it seems fairly clear that Russia learned from Belarus during the begin color revolutions because Belarus's preventative counter revolution occurred earlier. So certain things were taken by the Kremlin. I don't have an I don't have a simple answer for you here, Henry, in terms of whether Putin was taking ideas from Tatarstan or from Bashkortostan or Kamikia. I suspect he wasn't. I think a lot of it has come from the neighbours, and I think a lot of it has also come from the Soviet Union as well. But I don't have I can't conclusively prove that without interviewing the man. Yes, impossible for a book to cover everything, but uh, that's <laughs> terrific. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, OK, let me uh, start uh, relaying some of the questions that uh, come from the audience. So uh, first of all, from uh, Desiree Wins, um, are strategies of individual punishment or oppression adapted as autocracies monitor each other? Uh, for example, does the death of Prigozhin encourage other countries to step up their treatment of dissidents and mutineers? That's an excellent question. Um... I haven't thought about that in terms of how whether the death of Prigozhin how that influences other autocrats. I think that 
certainly autocrats know generally how to deal with dissidents anyway we've got, again using karimov as the example the idea is the idea at least the rumors are that he would put opposition activists in vats of acid to get rid of them lukashenko has disappeared numerous people through his time in office um i certainly think that it shows weakness by the Kremlin to shoot down a plane 30 miles north of Moscow, of the capital city. It highlights a certain weakness, and I don't think most autocrats would be willing to do that. Um, you know, it's much easier to remove someone surreptitiously from the street, as it were, rather than having to shoot down an entire plane. Um, so I don't know if that example highlights or provides a lot for other autocrats to uh, deal with but we did see today that uh azerbaijan arrested the former head of nagorno karabakh who was trying to get into armenia now whether he's a distance remains to be seen but for the Azeris, he certainly is um whether that is also quite on the scale of Prigozhin, we don't know but he was very quickly taken to baku and we don't quite know where he's gone to, gone to. I think that's more the autocratic tactic is to just take them as quickly as possible into the fort of a prison in Moscow. And that's the end as far as we know. OK, thanks. Um, so next, a question from uh, Uliana Mopchan, who um, uh, basically asks you uh, if your uh, research has, um, you know, sh if it sheds light on why some of the cases that you examine uh went one way and the others the other way so you know why did ukraine and moldova not follow the authoritarian consolidation path that uh russia and belarus has have so uh you know kind of you know do, do the factors that come up in your research or your research more generally shed light on that um well i would say originally you know coming from your 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 own research on the pyramid on paternal politics that that is one good explanation as to why Moldova and Ukraine have never really consolidated autocracy because there are multiple pyramids of power. What I would say in terms of the research in the book, I think, again, harking back to regional organisations, I think there is certainly something there. The fact that Moldova is, only a, is, is a member of the Commonwealth of Independent States only, the fact that Ukraine has left these organisations and never really implemented much of the Commonwealth of Independent States. It was both in the CIS and outside the CIS at the same time. This, I think, certainly is, a, is key. Belarus and Russia are members of all of these organizations. And so this provides a learning room uh, utopia, as it were, whereas Ukraine and Moldova are not. And therefore, there's less opportunities to learn. But I think it also goes back to the institutions, the history as well, that there it's been very difficult for these countries to, or for leaders, I should say, to try and consolidate autocracy. But we certainly have seen that Yanukovych did look towards Russia. Igor Dodon said he wanted to be in the next Lukashenko, of, the, the Lukashenko of Moldova, which was a frightening prospect. Um, so, you know, they do em try to emulate, but because of the differences in terms of the institutions it's very hard for them to be able to consolidate power the book did you know when it was being written at the end in 2019 it did appear at least for a brief moment and i'm sure henry will disagree with me on this um that vladimir Zelensky could go the same way as other ukrainian leaders have tried to consolidate power around them with the people with his servants of the people having control of the parliament that he put his friends in key positions of power. This is also the case for Poroshenko and for Yanukovych with their families. Thankfully, Putin had other ideas in terms of his horrendous invasion on Ukraine and the EU has actually not kicked the can down the road as I suspected it would do in terms of offering Ukraine a pathway to EU membership. And I think that will be enough pressure to keep Zelensky on the narrow path towards democratization although he seems to be doing a very fine job of that anyway. Um, so I think there's always attempts to try and consolidate power in these countries, but it's never quite worked because of the institutions and, as I would say, because of the regional organisations. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Alexander uh, Fisun asks a very interesting question that oh. kind of, I, I think, looks at the kind of the flip side of what you're arguing, sort of the other side of the, the coin, um, which is uh, why do authoritarian leaders like Kuchma in Ukraine in 2004 and Yanukovych in Ukraine in 2014 fail to learn how to prevent revolutionary regime change? So I think that question of, of, of like the other side of things, like, you, you know, what? Why do authoritarian regimes learn, but when do they fail to learn and why? And why do some seem to fail to learn in you know, more consequential ways? That's an excellent question, Alexander, and thank you for that. Um, I think in terms of 2004, Kushma, to a great extent, was a lame duck. That he's, his presidency was coming to an end. Um, and also the pressure from the wet from Western countries, from America, from the European Union, was quite clear in terms of how to deal with the protests. Um, simply as well, I think that we know, looking back at Yanukovych, I think he was fighting the last war, that he had failed to become president in 2004 and was trying to implement lessons to get elected in 2010, which he achieved, but was also unprepared for 2013, 2014. He was working towards 2015, the next Ukrainian presidential elections. And the Burkut and other organizations were not quite as ready-made as they perhaps could have, should have been in terms of dealing with protests, but he was building towards that. I think it is also, it's about the weak institutions to a great extent in places like Ukraine and Moldova, that this becomes much harder for these for regimes to consolidate power. They try up to a certain point, but because they don't have the capacity to go after the opposition, because Kushma and Yanukovych, at least nominally, were still talking to the European Union, trying to join the EU at some time in the possibly distant future, they were always trying to balance between the EU and Russia, and so were trying to play two fiddles as it were um so maintaining a relationship with both sides and that becomes very hard to consolidate power at least fully i would say okay great um so uh i i encourage people if you have other questions uh please uh keep them coming um i have a, a couple more that i'll i'll ask at this okay. point um so one is um the learning process, uh, do you expect this to, over time, lead to kind of a homogenization of authoritarianism? Uh, you know, do you expect kind of if regimes are learning from each other over time, they're going to look more and more alike, um, at least, you know, in kind of a co-evolution as they you know respond to new challenges related to, um, you know, development of new technologies and, uh, you know, global challenges? I wouldn't necessarily say that I would perceive them to be coming to become alike. I think that, as Milan Svolik has said, that uh, all autocracies are different in their own way. So there will always be nuances in terms of how autocrats develop the best practices, and they will always try and maintain. There is there is a certain nationalism, for want of a better phrase, that they want to do their own thing to a certain extent. Yes, of course, they'll look at the neighbours, but if something has worked in, let's say, uh, Armenia, then they'll use an Armenian solution, as it were, or a Kazakh solution. Um, so I think that certainly there will always be differences and the nuances between these autocracies, because no two autocracies are alike. Certainly dealing with, let's say, um, NGOs, civil society, the media, I think there are certain tactics that will become increasingly used, such as greater censorship, trying to create, trying to emulate somehow the Great Far Wall of China. We see this in terms of what Belarus under Victor Scheiman was trying to do, although Belarus didn't have anywhere near the same capacity uh, to do it. We can also see in terms of the foreign agents law, as to the speed with which that went through the post-Soviet region and even further afield into China. We see it in 2012, it was passed in Russia. And then in 2013, I think it was Azerbaijan, 2014, it was Tur Tajikistan, 2015, Kazakhstan, 2016, Uzbekistan. I may have got the names wrong, but it's all the way through the, the 2010s and goes to China in 2018. Even Ukraine and Moldova tried to pass 
something similar in for a foreign agents law in 2019 and the eu said you can pass it but we're not giving you any more money if you do so that was the end of that idea um so i think certainly there were certain pieces of legislation that will always be used and this again goes back to the regional organizations edward lemon and uh, oleg antonov have talked about this in terms of um the cis interparliamentary assembly and its legislation capacity having all the legislation of each member state that others can go to and look at so how let's say the kazakhs dealt with media or the azerbaijanis dealt with ngos those sort of things so this becomes a certain homogenization and max bader has also said that a lot of it is taken from um russian legislation almost word for word the dictatorship laws in 2014 under Yanukovych were word for word, according to Sonia Koshkina, taken from Russian and Belarusian legislation. So, so do um, authoritarian regimes ever learn anything uh, from each other or from any other country that might lead them to become more democratic? Um, I think that's an interesting point because autocracies in order to get some legitimate in order to increase the legitimacy may try a certain amount of liberalism or to li liberalize at certain points i think that this is a the idea of autocratic modernization authoritarian modernization that roberto Ferro and various others talk about as well i don't necessarily in terms of the book i don't think in terms of the, the four case studies there is an awful lot of that happening i think china is a particularly interesting example that so, so, you know, it, ch the Chinese government will look at, let's say, education as a way to try and improve education standards in China, in the regions that gets legitimacy for the local governments and by um, and the central government as well. And they'll also look, and they'll look at five democracies, let's say America, Canada, the Netherlands, Sweden, France, and they'll implement the five different education policies in five separate Chinese regions to see which one works best. So it becomes a learning ground. Sebastian Heilman of Trier University has talked about this extensively, that China has been particularly useful or effective, I would say, at doing this. And it's not just in terms of education, it's in terms of environmental policy as well, the economic side as well, to order, in order to get legitimacy, wider legitimacy among the population. And I think China is particularly relevant as a case study in regards to that. I don't necessarily see it this as the case for Russia, Belarus, the four, the two main autocracies, the two autocracies I look at in the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so Grant Silverman has a question. He notes that uh, much of the research that you are presenting has to do with the learning relationships between newly independent states who are members of shared multilateral organizations who have a shared history and 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 kind of a, a commonality of language, you know, Russian that they can exchange. Mm -hmm ideas through. Um, but what can be said for the ways that autocracies outside this geographical area learn from one another or from post-Soviet autocracies? So, for example, how would a country like Venezuela or Thailand take cues from Russia or Belarus? Well, that's a fascinating question. Um, we can certainly see that Lukashenko, Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus was very close to Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and Nicolas Maduro uh, today, that there has been an awful lot of um, cooperation, political cooperation, from my understanding, between the Belarusian and Venezuelan regimes trying to talk about legislation, talking about the protests that happened in Venezuela, the protests that happened in Belarus, and how the security services of each country over overcame those. Obviously, some, tr uh, some Belarusian tractors have also made it to Venezuela, so there is an economic ties as well. We also know from the Russian Security Council um, that Nikolai, as I mentioned, Nikolai Petrushev went to Algeria to find out how the Algerians dealt with their protests during the Arab Spring. We also he also did the same why the Egyptian regime failed in the Arab Spring. We can see these collaborate cooperation outside the post-Soviet region. Yes, I focused on the post-Soviet region. Yes, of course, there are strong links in terms of culture, history within these cases that's indeed the case and this is for future research to look at how other from countries like venezuela like cuba angola algeria china vietnam thailand 
how, whether they are also taking examples from the post-Soviet space and vice versa. And I would say that certainly, I, I would imagine it's certainly the case. As Alexander Cooley has said, the League of Authoritarian Gentlemen is very much with us. Um, so I think that there is a wider cooperation scale. What I wanted to show in the book was that this actually is something that occurs. And I thought the post-Soviet region, the four case studies of the post-Soviet region, made were, were best at show, representing that. But certainly this is a future research. Hey, terrific. Um, so there are a couple of questions that are, I think, potentially related to each other that I'll kind of pose together. Mm -hmm. Um, so one is from Desiree, Desiree Wins, uh, uh, who asks, uh, while authoritarians tend to refrain from naming successors, do they discuss or learn strategies of succession from each other uh, to ensure longevity and power after the incumbent passes? Or is that too risky information to share? Um, and the related question from Sirim uh, Parpiev is uh, whether or not uh, a scenario like what recently occurred in Kazakhstan um, you know, between Nazarbayev and Takayev uh, might be possible in uh, Russia and or Belarus? Well, those are excellent questions. I mean, the idea of succession. Um, spoiler alert, Jac uh, Jacob Tolstrup and Thomas Ambrosio, hopefully, will have an article out about uh, autocratic succession. So the idea that um, how autocracies go about that succession process because it is replete with with possibilities for regime collapse in terms of the you don't want to be the lame duck president as Kushma was in 2004 you don't want to choose the wrong person as Nazarbayev somehow managed to do with Takayev having believed that Takayev was his man um, it went spectacularly wrong for Nazarbayev um, the same so you want to make sure that your per, the person you put in is always going to be there and Azerbaijan, I think, is a particularly good example of this. You know, you have the father passing it on to the son. And I think we could plausibly see this in Belarus. Lukashenko was always talked about Kolya, his youngest son, being um, so upset when Alexander is out of the room that he cries. He always needs to have Lukashenko with him. And he's always with Lukashenko. And certainly he's been giving more and more roles. The same is also true of Turkmenistan under the Berdy Mohamedovs as well. So there is this attempt, I think, that keeping it in the family is particularly important because it's less likely the son is going to remove you because he could also threaten his own assets as well. And um, invariably, it is male to male lineage. In terms of Russia, the Kazakhstan example, certainly I think the presidential administration had an idea of a Nazarbayev scenario uh, in 2019, possibly that Putin would step aside to the head of the Security Council, which would give, be given more powers, and someone like Medvedev would get his second chance to become president of Russia again with much reduced powers, or possibly a prime ministership. They could change, become Putin could become prime minister again with bigger, more powers, and a ceremonial presidency, like in Germany. Um, that didn't work. It's quite clear that with Nazar what happened with Nazarbayev and Takayev, Putin got cold feet, as I think most autocrats in the post-Soviet space did very quickly, and that won't happen. Putin, we know, at least from my understanding, doesn't trust a lot of people, and... I think that this is increasingly a problem for the Kremlin, and we can talk about this as well in terms of the war, that how Putin is going to find a successor remains to be seen. And we simply don't know where it's coming from, because, again, autocrats don't like naming their successors, because sometimes it doesn't work out, in which case the autocrat looks weak. Sometimes the successor removes the, aut the autocrat from power, which is a problem. Um, so finding your cap capacity to survive is very hard for an autocrat. Um, and Putin doesn't, as I said, trust people. So there isn't this idea that he would willingly pass power on, like Yeltsin did before him, to someone like Putin. So I think for Russia, it's going to be a challenge. There was just a, a brief request. You had mentioned this article. I think it was by Thomas Ambrosio. And who was the other author? Uh, Jacob Tolstrup, it's not out yet. Um, it's going to hopefully be coming out fairly soon. So 
please look out for it. But it's about autocratic secession. Uh, and I think Belarus and Azerbaijan will be particularly key um, cases that they'll look at. OK, great. Um, so I wonder maybe if you could talk. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I'd just be interested in here to hear now that we're kind of, um, uh, you know, we've discussed a lot of the ideas of the book, um, you know, how you arrived at the idea for the book. And then maybe if you could just talk a little bit about how you decided to structure the book, kind of maybe walk us through the the flow of it, um, just so we kind of have a sense of, of how it unfolds. Sure. I mean, I was always interested in this. Um, this is going to sound like a homage to Thomas Ambrosio. I do apologize. But ever since his book on authoritarian backlash came out in 2009 and there was a postgraduate student at uh, UCL who foolishly spent a lot of money uh, of his hard, you know, limited amount, limited funds on this one book. And this effectively became my Bible. Um, and the idea of authoritarian learning has always fascinated me and how it developed over time and how these regimes are trying to adapt in terms of to develop best survival practices. So this has been, I would say, a love affair uh, for nearly for a decade or so, trying to really understand how these regimes develop, uh, how they learn, what they learn, why they learn, and how how extensive that learning actually is. And I thought that this, having been interested in the post-Soviet space, this was the best region to really focus on in understanding this authoritarian learning. Um, so how the book is structured? Well, what I wanted to do was to really provide, you know, in terms of the methodology, I can't conclusively prove authoritarian learning. It's very different to democratic learning. And I'll use the example from the United Kingdom of David Cameron, who has been very open about the fact that the British Conservative Party, at least under him, uh, was learning an awful lot from the moderate party in Sweden. That Sweden, historically a social democracy, had elected a centre-right government for the first time in decades. And David Cameron was particularly interested in this idea of, whilst Britain is nowhere near a social democracy, David Cameron wanted to have this uh, pleasant conservatism so create a social democracy with conservative characteristics. And he was taking an awful lot from the moderate party. And he was very vocal about this. Autocrats don't talk about that. They don't talk about learning from each other. So it is very much inference. And I think that this is what I was trying to do in the book, is to show lots of examples um, of learning from different perspectives. So failure, external failure, internal failure, looking at successes, looking at the role of regional organizations as well, and also getting to grips with the networks that shape the learning within these four case studies. And I thought this was the best way to represent or at least show that there is the strong possibility, I would argue, although I'm sure others may not, that these regimes are cooperating with each other and that this is learning. I'm open to I'm open open to debate on this. You know, I can only provide so much evidence, um, and can only say that with all the variables that I've been able to find, this is what I believe is happening. But it may not be the case. I I would suggest that it is. So, and in terms of chapter by chapter flow, in terms of chapter by chapter flow, what I tried to do was looking at different aspects in terms of it's not just looking at the case studies so going it's trying to look at the different themes within case studies where they learn from the different uh networks that exist in terms of the secure looking at the security councils looking at even ambassadors foreign ministries interior ministries security councils this sort of aspect looking at russian learning from the arab spring from the euro maidan from the orange revolution the same is also true of belarus potentially models as well. Singapore, I think, is particularly key. Yes, of course, China is the obvious other examples that they try and learn from, and they do. But also Singapore is, I think, particularly relevant, less so for Belarus. But for the other case studies, Singapore, because it's economic model, because of its prowess in terms of an established autocracy, has been particularly important. But I urge you 
to please look at the book um, in terms of the detail, because as I say, it does try to create a thematic flow throughout the book, trying to explain from examples that this is how I believe learning is occurring in autocracies. Okay, and maybe um, just to squeeze in one last question um, again, Thank you. Uh, you know, I know this is beyond the scope of your research, so it'd be yes. more just about, um, you know, what you might have observed kind of having these uh, processes in, in, in view uh, in such depth based on your research. Um, you know, do you see learning processes taking place now, um, especially in the wake of the, uh, the, the sharp uh, escalation of the Russia-Ukraine war um, and the and the trends that have developed within Russia itself as far as the regime goes um you know do, do you do you expect this to be kind of driver of a, of a new wave of authoritarian learning um of, of some form do you already see signs of that um you know or is this something kind of different maybe you know the the you know once you're talking about war maybe I don't know does that make it easier to learn or maybe it makes it harder uh for regimes to learn from each other I think it's, an, it's certainly an interesting question. I would say that there is certainly learning within the Russian regime. Um, Sergei Kirienko and various members of the presidential administration, and to a lesser extent, Mikhail Mishustin as well, have been trying to find ways out of the mess that they have got themselves into. Um, so there is certainly this case of trying to deal with the situation as it is without causing too many waves because that could you know this is yes it's russia's war but putin obviously plays a key role in regards to this what i think is particularly interesting is that kazakhstan Takayev has openly has said said i think to or show, certainly said that we need to have inf clear information channels because it seems that, you know, having failed, obviously, in 20, we, we forget in January 2022, there were, Kazakh, there were protests in Kazakhstan because of what events that happened very soon after in Ukraine. But also in regards to Belarus, the ivory tower situation, and I've written about the end of adaptive authoritarian in Belarus, and I think that's certainly the case. I think possibly this may be happening in Russia, but that's still open to interpretation. Um, but certainly the way that Russia went to war. I think that with Sergei Beseda passing and Viktor Medvedchuk passing on information they knew Putin wanted to hear. Putin and his inner circle, I think, had increasingly started believing their own propaganda. Tokayev and Mirza Yoyev in Uzbekistan have said we need to keep other alternative information flows open. How autocracies are going to be able to do that? Because the difficulty is, of course, that if you keep other information flows open, then that can leak out to your public, which becomes much harder to then control. But it is also a difficulty for autocracies because you want to have alternative information coming to you because it allows you to make better and informed decisions. So how Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are going to deal with that situation remains to be seen. Whether it's actually true is, a, is also another question. Takayev has called Nur Otan the listening party, but it doesn't seem to have listened an awful lot over the last few years. Um, so it may just be talk, but I think that certainly autocrats in the post-Soviet space are looking at Russia's mistake in invading the full-scale invasion of Ukraine and trying to deal with how they can not fall prey to the propaganda to believing their own propaganda. All right. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, uh, but um, I just want to uh, encourage people to uh, find this book. Uh, the title is memorable, The Authoritarian International. Buy it, read it, and we'll continue this conversation uh, as a field uh, moving forward. I think it's a great contribution, um, and I look forward to many more discussions to come. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Dr. Hall for joining us for this discussion, and um, I hope people enjoy the rest of their day. So. Thank you very much. Have a great day and thank you for listening to me.